Hey there, my partner here. I'm uh, making this video today because this whole idea of humans being just a computer simulation, not just humans, but the entire universe being a computer simulation, is something that has been uh, gaining popularity lately. And, I mean, it's been published on Yahoo, uh, a bunch of different very popular internet websites have been publishing an article about um, this notion that scientists have come up with a way to test whether or not we are living in a computer simulation. And rather than look at the tests, I wanted to look at the actual theory itself. And so I went to the source of this theory, which is, um, he's, a, he's a man, he, I think he's a professor at Oxford. His name is Nick Bostrom. And he published this paper called Are You Living in a Simulation? And it's at simulation-argument.com slash simulation.html. I'll link it in the bottom. But uh, So here, here's my critique on it. He, he starts the paper saying, quote, Many works of science fiction, as well as some forecasts by serious technologists and futurologists, predict that enormous amounts of computing power will be available in the future. Now, the first problem here is that he's bringing up science fiction, and I know that um, science fiction has some, sometimes been considered to be accurate. Sometimes uh, their predictions have come true. But this really has nothing to do with science. Um, in science, we make a hypothesis, which is we assume a certain situation. And he's going to do this too, but to start out with this idea of looking at science fiction and predictions done by futurologists is a little bit um, irrelevant. Uh, but he continues. So here's his hypothesis. Let us suppose for a moment, a moment that these predictions are correct. One thing that later generations might do with their super powerful computers is run detailed simulations of their forebears or of people like their forebears. Because their computers would be so powerful, they could run a great many such simulations. And so here's the real hypothesis. This is what he wants us to believe. Suppose that there, or suppose that these simulated people are conscious, as they would be if the simulations were sufficiently fine-grained, and if a certain quite widely accepted position in the philosophy of mind is correct. So he doesn't even want to back up his position. He just wants to say that you should assume this, and you should assume it because these simulations would be very fine-grained, and it's a widely accepted position in the philosophy of mind. Well, uh, I don't accept something because it's popular, and I don't accept something because you use words like fine-grained or you wouldn't understand it's in the future, these kinds of things. Now, uh, you need to analyze something rationally with your own mind. And so here's my here's my analysis of what he just said. This position is absolutely ludicrous, and it is easy to see why when the key terms are defined. <clears throat> the key terms here are conscious, simulate, people, and computer. They all need to be defined in the context of this theory for anybody to make sense of it, even the, the proponent of the theory. He doesn't define these words. He has no idea what he's talking about. However, Nick, Nick Bostrom, the, the writer of this theory, leaves these terms ambiguous in order to subtly get you to use your imagination to fill in the blanks. When he asks you to, quote, suppose that the simulated people are conscious, he's pulling the wool over your eyes. And here's why. To simulate is, of course, a verb. We can define simulate as, quote, an action intended to represent another action or shape. 
rationally, quote, simulated people is a package deal. Simulated people is a phrase representing the process being performed by the computer. The computer here is an object. Since it's a process, simulated people is a concept. We use the term simulation or simulated people as a noun to efficiently communicate the entire process or verb as a conceptual whole. And it's easy enough to understand when that's made explicit. Yet this sort of quick and dirty talk makes it easy for them to then attribute actions to the new noun that they invented, even though that noun does not represent an object but rather another action. This is called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. It's the reification of a concept, and it is entirely irrational. It's a fundamental error. So let me expand here. Only objects, that which has shape, can act, can be conscious, can simulate, etc., the proponent of this theory specifies that computers are the objects doing the simulating, but then they subtly switch the acting object. They switch that acting object from the computers to people, to the phrase simulated people. They go from computers, which is an actual object that can perform actions, to simulated people which is a, a pseudo-object, a placeholder that we use to make talking about a process or a verb easier. Simulated people is not itself an object. However, continuing on, though, the per pursuant definition, uh, pursuant to the definition of simulate, simulated people is completely synonymous with this verb, to simulate making it the action performed by a computer. Simulated people is only understood in the minds of the audience who watches the actions of the computer. The, quote, people here, the simulation, does not become an object, no matter how fine-grained it is. Therefore, the notion that the simulated people are conscious is entirely irrational because it ascribes another action, consciousness, to the concept of the simulated people. It treats the concept as an actor, committing the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Only objects can act in a scientific theory. Processes like simulations can never perform any actions like being conscious. The entire simulation theory therefore follows as incoherent due to this faulty hypothesis. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you understand the uh, errors in this theory of simulation now a little bit more clearly.